Everyone ready? Oh, gracious. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending today's SCLA Continuing Education webinar. I am Lisa Giskis, and I will be your moderator today. Please see the SCLA website at scla.org to find our future webinars. The next one in this series, Engaging Your Patrons Through Special Collections, will be on Thursday, March 26th from 2.30 to 3.30 p.m. I would also like to invite you to celebrate libraries with the SCLA Continuing Education Committee at our upcoming special event during National Library Week on the evening of Thursday, April 23rd. Look for details on the SCLA website. I would like to introduce our presenters from Spartanburg County Public Libraries. They are Charity Rouse, Director of Local History, Gretchen Maltzby, Director of Collection Management, and Harrison Gage, Processing Archivist. Feel free to ask questions in the chat box during the presentation. I will compile the questions and our presenters will address them at the end of the session. Please be sure to mute your microphone. A recording of this session along with presentation slides will be emailed to all registered users. The, vi the video will be uploaded, uploaded to SCLA's YouTube channel for later viewing. Please, everyone, mute your devices. All right, take it away. Hi, everybody. This is Charity. Um, we are glad to share a little bit of our journey into building our digital collections here at Spartanburg County Public Libraries. Um, I've only been here for five and a half years of this, so uh, we're going to tag team a little bit. I'll speak, and then Gretchen will speak, and then Harrison will speak, and um, we'll try to identify when we change speakers for you. Um, so a little bit about Spartanburg County Public Libraries. Uh, our first location opened on Morgan Square in downtown Spartanburg in 1885. We now have 10 locations plus uh, bookmobile and homebound services serving the whole county. Our overall budget is about $15 million and our materials budget is $1.5 million roughly. Um, this is a map of our county. Uh, we go from the upper left with Landrum, upper right Chesney, um, and then moving down the county, we have Inman, Boiling Springs, Middle Tiger, Calpins, Cyril Westside, Packlet, Woodruff, Headquarters Branch, and then our Bookmobile Homebound Services. And then the 11th location that is starred is uh, Pages on Pine, which is our Friends of the Library um, bookstore and sorting facility. Um, working with 10 locations uh, on the library branches themselves, uh, is somewhat of a challenge because we have been very good at collecting um, Spartanburg City materials, but we have a lot more than Spartanburg City that our county library is involved in. And so we continue to work with our branches to help develop um, local history programming collections, et cetera. We do have within local history um, an oral history program that is growing, helping capture stories of different parts of the county, different uh, types of things within the county, um, such as musical history or um, African-American history, um, schools that no longer exist, those types of things. Our Kennedy Room of Local History um, and Genealogy is uh, named for Helen uh, Fasu Stevens Kennedy, who was our library's benefactress, um, in honor of her late husband, Lionel Chalmers Kennedy, who died in 1880. Uh, they had no children, so in uh, a lot of respects, the library system is their child. Um, and we take that legacy fairly seriously. Our first two libraries, were called Kennedy Library or Kennedy Free Library. And then um, in the 1950s, we moved to Spartanburg County Public Libraries as our system name. Um, and so 
we maintain the Kennedy name with local history and genealogy services. One of the things that was recognized in the 1990s and early 2000s was that our history is our threat. Um, we are our own worst enemy in the collection and maintenance of the history of our location and our um, county. We had a situation here in Spartanburg County, which may not be in any way, shape, or form unique, but uh, the New York Times bought the local paper in the mid-1980s and um, apparently just wholesale threw out a lot of the historic uh, records from the paper, and they went into the Walford landfill. And so that was a wake-up call for people who were concerned about the preservation of local history here in the county. And so the library itself began to collect parts of local history, primarily paper-based, photographic-based parts of local history. We do have a county museum, and they work very diligently on the three-dimensional objects. We concentrate on the paper-based, text-based objects. Um, through this, we have dedicated administrative support and have developed community liaisons which help um, support and get the word out about our local history collection um, and preservation efforts. Um, in, I believe it was 2009, uh, we had a board mandate um, come down to create a local history center initiative. Uh, my predecessor, Steve Smith, worked with that, and he started uh, what we call our Addicts to Archives program. And this is a way that we have used to get the word out that we are collecting these things. For protection, we serve as the archive for a number of community organizations. We have some family um, archival collections and different things. Some of the items that we will talk about today have been um, given to us for our archival collections. Others of the collections um, were loaned to us for digitization purposes so that we could get them and preserve them digitally, but we don't own the artifacts. And so with that mix of resources, um, we do encounter some interesting um, dynamics with what we can share and how we can share it, those types of things. And now um, Gretchen Maltzby is going to talk a little bit about the history of our early digital efforts. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Gretchen Maltzby. I'm the Director of Collection Management here at Spartanburg County. And um, I'm going to walk through a bit of our history as far as building digital collections goes in the hopes that you'll get a feel for um, how our workflows have evolved over time as we have learned more about what we were doing and um, also as staffing changed. Um, so maybe you can um, hopefully learn from our mistakes. Um, so our first, um, I can do it, I can handle that. So our first efforts at digitization began in 2007. Uh, we had a team of library staff under the purview of our web services department um, to begin scanning in local history collections that we had on site here. Um, so the head of local history at that time was selecting items to be scanned. Um, our web services librarian was creating metadata in coordination with our um, technical services department catalogers. And then that content was being formatted uh, for loading into Content DM, which is the platform that we use to host our digital collections. So Content DM goes live uh, for us in 2008, and um, this is what our earliest site used to look like. We just had a few uh, photographic collections. Okay, so I will get into the weeds of some things. Um, so our first collections in Content DM were pretty straightforward, simple photographic collections. And if you're just getting started in building a digital collection, a discrete photograph collection is a really great place to start, especially if you're using something like Content DM. 
um, because single-sided objects are fairly straightforward when it comes to preparing them for loading. Um, uh, Double-sided images or um, text with hierarchies like chapters um, or three-dimensional objects or oral histories can be a little bit trickier. So um, it's good to start off simple. Um, so we utilize the metadata um, recommended by the South Carolina Digital Library, and I'll get a little bit more into that in just a second. Um, they um, use a Dublin Core schema, um, and it's available through their website. And as far as metadata goes, that is a pretty user-friendly schema. And if you're new to digitization and metadata, it's not too intimidating to um, jump into. So between 2008 and 2012, our head of web services basically had created a digital collections working group made up of local history staff and technical services staff. And they were creating scanning priorities and they were developing workflows around metadata gathering. Um, primarily working mostly with local content, but we were starting to see more um, collections come in um, from external uh, patrons. So our workflow at this time is basically that the scans were created. Then if we were going to create a digital collection, metadata was created. Spreadsheets of that metadata were shared with our catalogers for Library of Congress subject headings, and then they were loaded into Content DM. So if my current self could go back and give that um, my 10, year old, 10 years previous self some advice, um, I would say to tell that team of people to resist the impulse to scan everything. Um, unless a collection is alone and you've got to um, scan it while you have it. Um, don't scan materials on site just because you, you think you might want to load them up in, for the public one day. Um, don't work on a collection until you're ready to move it into a public space, because what you end up doing is building a really large and unwieldy dark archive that you eventually just get rid of because you have better equipment and your IT staff are telling you that it takes too long to back up those massive servers of content that is just sitting there. Okay, so we're gonna um, uh, take a look really quickly at the South Carolina Digital Library site. Um, it's just at scmemory.org. Um, and this is basically where um, everyone who is actively creating and sharing archival digital collections are harvesting and um, aggregating their content in one place. And if you are new to creating digital collections, you have a small team available to work on um, digital collections, this is where you should start. Um, in the top right section, there is a place for contributors, and that has everything you need to get started from making contacts as far as digitization goes, help with metadata. If you want to harvest your collections and share them at this site, you can. Um, it's a really, really great resource for getting started. And also you can get to the metadata schema here. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit more about growth. Um, the last 10 years have seen a lot of growth and change here in Spartanburg um, as far as our digital collection development goes. Um, we have acquired a, well, we did acquire um, a full-time dedicated staff member to work on digital collections. We purchased large-scale scanning equipment, and um, this is the time when we really refined our digitization workflows. We went from about five digital collections to our current total of about 20. Um, on our hosted site now, we have about 28 gigs worth of content, which totals about 11,500 items. Okay, so this collection was a real turning point for us. Um, this William Lynch postcard collection was a loaned collection. Um, it contains about 2,500 postcards. We scanned both the front and the back um, with a contractual um, 
scanner at the time. And um, we then moved on to create extensive metadata for these cards. Um, we fully transcribed all the messages, all the addresses, and um, in doing so, we maybe went a little bit overboard, but we also created a really useful look into Spartanburg's, um, Spartanburg County's history in it from an image standpoint, and also a, a pretty interesting genealogy tool because all of these cards and the names and the messages associated with them are full text searchable. Um, this collection did, though, really um, kind of bring to the forefront the notion that um, we needed a dedicated digital collection staff member. We had, once these um, images were scanned, 5,000 images on our hands with no metadata and, and, and no one to really work on them. So um, this, this collection brought about um, the in 2012, our, our first um, digital collections librarian, who was still working under the purview of the Web Services Department. Um, this also brought um, us to the conclusion that we needed more robust scanning equipment. Um, by this time, we had acquired very large um, architectural collections. And when you're trying to scan a five foot long linen um, textile schematic, um, you have to scan it in pieces and stitch it together, and that's really not how you want to use your time. So uh, between up to this point, um, a team of Kennedy Room staff, web services staff, and technical services staff were meeting regularly to um, establish scanning priorities, to um, look at the legalities for how we were taking in um, outside collections, which we were being um, which were donations, permanent donations, and also loans. Um, so this brings us to the topic of deeds of gift. And here I'll just say, um, you could do a whole presentation on deeds of gift, but um, adapt agreements from archival institutions that have been doing this. Uh, digitization at this point is not new, and you do not have to reinvent any kind of legal will, legal wheel when it comes to uh, digital or deeds of gift use what's out there. Um, and also, don't worry too much about it. Um, they can be intimidating because they're, they're legal documents, but um, just use find one that you like, adapt it to your location, and then get going. Um, don't, don't let it be an intimidating thing. OK, I'm going to touch on equipment um, just a moment. Um, Ooh, the first, um, well, we started we started scanning with these tiny little uh, Canon scanners that are at the bottom right of this screen. Um, we still have a few of those that we do local work on. If you are um, interested in getting involved in a digitization program and you don't have a lot of money, the Epson 11 by 17 scanner, which is at the top right of this screen, is kind of your money shot. Um, it can scan documents, it can scan um, photographs, it can scan negatives. Um, it's really adaptable, it's really user-friendly, and it's a real, work a real workhorse. The one we're showing here is about 10 years old and it still works great. Um, our more recent heavy-duty piece of equipment is this Scan Master Zero, which is on the bottom left of your screen. Um, this um, was a really large purchase that we had to get our board involved with, um, but it can scan um, high resolutions in seconds. Uh, the platform is three and a half by four feet, and if you can tell from this picture, the um, scanning bed actually acts like a book cradle. So the um, top, though the front part of that scan bed comes apart and you can balance a book on either side of it, which protects the spine. We also have on order this uh, book eye scanner, which is at the top right of our screen. And that's actually going to be um, utilized both by staff and patrons who come to use our local history materials, which can't be um, check, uh, circulated. Okay. 
So I'm going to um, wrap up our digitization history um, right now. Um, one of the important things you have to think about when you're going to begin a digitization program is um, how are your departments structured, um, what staff are available to help you within those departments, and then kind of planning for change because there's always um, staffing changes which, which can affect your workflows. So in 2014, um, our digital collections department was created. And um, at this point, our digital collections librarian was driving digital collection development. This worked well in some ways because we had dedicated advocacy for digital collections and we didn't really before. Um, but our, if you are an institution that is um, both digitizing content and serving as an archive, your workflow has to be a little bit more considered. Um, you have to think about the materials that you're taking in and how you're treating them and caring for them. So up to this point, our workflow was a little bit backwards. Uh, we were bringing content in, scanning it, sometimes creating digital collections, sometimes not. And then we would process materials uh, to the best of our ability. Um, so in 2014, we um, create, we implemented a locally hosted instance, no, I'm sorry, not local hosted, a um, hosted instance of archive space. And that is when you start to see our digitization workflow write itself and correct itself so that we're first caring for the archives that are in our possession and then we're very intentionally creating digital collections based on those um, archival collections. So now I'm going to turn it over to Harrison Gage, who's our processing archivist, and she's going to talk more about how we connect all of our various um, archival collections and digital collections so that they are fully accessible. Okay. Hi, everyone. So I'm Harrison, and I am the processing archivist here. So um, we first hired our first archivist in 2016. Um, I am our second archivist, so that archivist left in 2017, and I started in 2018. Um, and when I started, um, we actually had already acquired quite a bit of archival material, um, but really not too much had really been done with what we had. So kind of my first kind of prerogative was to kind of um, put a pause really on digitization. When I first started, I kind of said, hold up. Um, I kind of need to get a handle of what we have. Um, so at that point, we basically we had some digital stuff and content DM. We had gone archive space in 2014. So we had a little bit in archive space, but not really a lot. And so I was kind of like, well, we need to kind of start connecting everything we have. Um, so first thing that we did was really, um, that might be kind of confusing to people, is the processing archivist is actually in collection management where the former digitization area is. Um, so this is kind of a picture of what my space looks like. And you can kind of see the arrow is pointing to where our large scanner that Gretchen just <laughs> talked about is. Um, so we've kind of, kind of had an ad hoc space created for archival processing. Um, a part of that is just we're very limited in space and local history didn't really have a good open space for me to be working in. So um, we kind of put me here, but it also it kind of had a great added effect in the fact that I, I manage a collection and so I'm in collection management. And it also gives me a chance to really be near, near Gretchen who has the experience with digital collections. The one staffs person who is doing any digitization right now is a part-time person in collection management. So she is here. I'm also near our um, catalogers, which has been very important to us as we try and figure out how to really kind of connect everything that we're doing. But um, basically in 2018, I started and I basically said, I need to get a handle really on what our physical objects are and we need to get stuff more in archive space before we really look at what we're doing in content DM. So that's really what I've worked on. Um, and so that, that way we can look into archive space and say, okay, here's what we have. What in archive space do we then want to put into content DM? So now in archive space, we have all of our collections more better described, 
um, we have actual finding aids that have the contents of the folders listed so that someone can just look into it and say, oh, I'm really interested in this. And then we can say, okay, someone's really interested in this. Now we can go forward and digitize it because we know it's going to get used. And of what we have, we have almost a thousand linear feet of documents and photographs. About two thirds of that is the collection that Charity mentioned at the very beginning, the stuff that we acquired from our local newspaper that didn't get thrown out into the landfill. So um, that collection gets pretty heavily utilized. And so that's definitely in our forefront when we think of like future digitization projects. We also have a couple hundred audiovisual materials and we do get questions about digitizing that. That is also a future project. Um, we do have in house a way we can digitize VHS tapes. Um, through our makerspace sparkspace area, but um, we right now don't really do that too much as we try and get more of a handle of still more of the physical documents and photos. We have 25,000 maps and almost 15,000 architectural plans. So again, it's very important and great for us that we have the large scanner so that if we do have a patron come in and say, you know, I live in Welford and I really like the maps though, can, can we like, can this drive a new collection? We go, yes, we can We can do that. We can handle that. Um, but kind of one of the big things we've been working on really recently now that we're almost to the point where really we're going to restart digitization now that we kind of, now that I've come in, we've kind of worked through a kind of a better workflow of, okay, we have a physical collection like we have on the left and we have the digital collection on the right. How do we make sure that our patrons are finding that we have these? And how do we make sure if someone's looking at physical collection, can we make sure that they know we have a digital collection? And if they're looking at the digital collection, can we make sure that they know we have the physical collection? Because going forward, we're not necessarily going to digitize an entire physical collection. So we need to make sure if they're looking at the digital collection, they can access that physical collection or more stuff that they could be interested in looking at is available. So um, this is kind of a screenshot of what our um, Polaris, which is our catalog looks like. So if anyone is looking for um, the Bessie Norris Wofford collection, which is what our previous slide showed, um, they will actually see in our catalog that we both have an archival collection and a digital collection. And it'd be kind of confusing people why we didn't just make one um, catalog record for this. Um, and that's just because we want to make sure it's as clear as possible to patrons that we have both. Um, and so if anyone is interested in what this kind of looks like from a cataloger standpoint, um, this is an example of what the bid record looks like for the digital collection. And you can see we've highlighted the 856 field. That is where we put a link in so that people can be in the catalog and see, oh, this interests me. What is it? They can click on it and then it will take them to the content DM so they can see it immediately and they can understand what it is that this is. We've also done this in archive space to content DM. So um, in archive space, you can create what's called a digital object. Um, and it kind of acts as um, content or um, archive space can't host an object like content DM can, which is why we need to have them be able to communicate with each other, because that is um, a bit of a downfall for archive spaces. It basically will hold text, but it won't hold a digital object. So basically, we've created uh, what's a digital object for the collection. So basically, um, the digital object, if you click on that, it will link you to content DM. And then in the linked records, that link is the link to the finding aid. So this kind of acts as kind of a go between page. You can go to either. You can go to the finding aid from this page, or you can go to the digital collection. And then this is what it looks like in content DM. So this way, we're basically, we put it in the source field for metadata telling you that this is what this this is where it comes from. So this way if you're really interested in the item that you saw on content DM, you can look at it and say, oh, now I have more information. This is kind of where we can put the stuff that doesn't quite fit well in the metadata field. And that way they can kind of also more easily see the like whole picture, what is this collection? Um, we've We've been working on this a little bit. The collection that we've been working on this with the um, Bessie Norris, it's a really great collection to work on because it's really small. It's like 0.25 linear feet. It's a very doable collection, but it's really great because, um, you know, not many people think of collecting funeral programs, so it's kind of been a great little um, project to work on. And so I really recommend if you really kind of want to like go back and really like funky with all the links and stuff, do it kind of with a small collection that's really doable. Um, within archive space, 
ourselves, we have um, a digital object record for each of the individual items. Um, you know, for William Lynch with 2,500 postcards, you can't really do that. But for a collection this size of um, about 50 items, it's pretty doable. And that way, if you're in archive space, you can see, oh, I like this item. Here's the link immediately to it, and it'll take you to Content DM so people can find it, which is really, um, you know, we're a public library. We've installed in all of our patrons the idea of everything's in the catalog. Um, so we can try and fight them for ages about how do you find the things because, you know, it's very hard to explain to public library patrons what is the archive, how do I access it, what is it, I'm scared, I don't know what it is. Um, we've just found that trying to put everything in the catalog kind of makes it easier for them. Um, of course, the catalog has its downsides. Again, we can't host the digital objects in it. Finding aids can only be so descriptive in the catalog. So this is why we're really trying to put our energy into the workflow, which is why that they can find it because we know they will search the catalog. We hope they will search our content DM and the archive space, but we know they will search the catalog, which is why we really decided to add into the workflow this linking idea because we really think it will work to try and expand the patrons that are finding this information because otherwise they just don't know that we have these primary sources. And so we're hoping that as long as we make it as clear as possible in the catalog, this is a primary source, it's a little bit different than the books, but you know, you found it, it's here, here's all the information about it, you know, we're really hopeful that this will really help bump up those numbers for people finding it. And hopefully that will also get more in person into the Kennedy room trying to look at the things because they saw a part of the collection online, they're like, I want to see the rest of it. Um, so. Now, in spring 2018, we migrated um, Content DM, so it no longer looks like back it did in 2010, and now it looks like this. We now have 19 collections in it, almost 20. Um, and going forward, really, um, now that we've, we've taken the break in 2018, we've really reworked our workflow. We've thought about what do we have in the archival collections. We now really know what's in the archival collections now that I've had the time to really go through and process it. So going forward, we're really looking about, like, what collections make sense going forward so that we don't have to spend time, because that's another big thing that when I started was going through and looking through the giant dark archive that Gretchen mentioned that we had a, a good bit of that early years was spent me trying just to figure out what do we have in here. Um, it was a lot of deleting multiple objects that, you know, we had saved it in one folder and we moved it to another folder and so in some cases we had five tips of the same thing which was just taking up a crazy amount of room. Um, so going forward like future collections we're thinking about is um, we have a publishing part of our um, local history room and they are publishing a book about the 100th year anniversary of our local theater um, program. So we're working right now on digitizing and creating the metadata for um, uh, almost 100 years of theater programs that we have to try and create a digital collection that will kind of complement that book that we're doing. Also, um, we're hearing from staff at the branches. They want yearbooks to be digitized um, because they're having people come in and look at the books and sometimes they'll sneak the books and cut their photos out. And so we're, we're listening to our, what our branches are telling us and saying, you know, we really love having the yearbooks, but we just can't keep them safe here. And so we're hoping to kind of go forward and digitize them so that that way they can be accessible to everyone and that'd be really good for the branches. Also, um, we're trying to get more in touch with what we're doing for summer reading. So um, the summer reading theme for this year is food. Um, and so um, the adult services came to us and said, hey, cookbooks, um, you know, we love that we have cookbooks in the Kennedy room, but you know, no one can check them out. So they don't really get used because most people now just kind of look for the recipes online and they don't really want to come into the library, take the photos of the book and then leave because that's a lot of steps. So, um, you know, that's another thing we're thinking about. Can we digitize all the cookbooks? Um, for the most part, they're like locally published ones. So we don't really have to even worry about copyright because a lot of them were even before 1924. So um, we're kind of to the point finally where we've trained a couple more staff members on how to do the metadata creation. Um, we've, now that we've like taken a step back on the digitization, now we can kind of go back forward into it now. 
um, with people able to create the metadata so we don't have this giant backlog of digital stuff that when we look at it, we just don't remember what it is. Um, and <laughs> so we hopefully now that we have the archival items, they're processed, they're described, we can now go forward and digitize them, describe them digitally, and then when they're online, we can now immediately link them to the archive space in the catalog so that the most amount of people, when it is digitally published, can find it. Um, and if you have any interest in any of the um, various sites that I'm talking about, because it's kind of confusing that we have all these different sites um, and they're linking to each other and it's exciting, but also kind of confusing about which site you're on. Um, so we've included the links to the Kennedy Room page, the Historical Digital Collections, and then also to the Archive Space page. Um, and I encourage you to look at all of them, especially the archive space page, because I spent a lot of time writing the finding aids, and I would love for people to look at them. Um, so um, that's kind of the end of my section. So um, we can open it up to questions to any of the three of us, um, whatever people want to know. Um, at this point, people can unmute their devices if they so desire because I don't see any activity in our chat. Um, I I have a question about things that are born digital and you're basically you're opening up to your local community there. What what do you feel about born digital items and um, going forward in the future? Okay, so um, born digital items are something that everybody is struggling with at this point. Um, we do have some people who have submitted some born digital items. One of the issues we have with some of those submissions is quality that they didn't scan it at as high a resolution as we would like. Um, we do ask that people um, contact us and we will work with them um, we do try to digitize when we can. Um, our makerspace does have um, the equipment for people to digitize photographs and things. We had initial, initially talked with them when that opened in 2016 that um, part of that agreement would be that we would get a copy of those digitized items um, and the metadata was the problem the metadata and the ownership and the ability to say, no, I do have the rights to sign off on this, that you can put this on your website. Um, and most people don't know whether they have the rights or not. And a lot of the things that are scanned do not have those rights. Um, they are scanning things that were taken by a professional photographer, um, those types of things. Um, Many of the things, especially early family photographs, they may, you know, they may be in the public domain prior to 1924, but it's just a little messy. And so we decided not to start accepting those things at that point, but um, we may revisit that in the future. As I said, most of, a lot of the time that that has been open, we have been um, on hold with a lot of the growth in our digital collections simply because we were trying to get a handle on what we had already digitized. Um, Gretchen or Harrison, you got anything on Born Digital? Yeah, I mean, we haven't we haven't been faced with a a really large donation in an, an already digital format yet. <laughs> um, you know, we've. We've all been to training sessions on how to deal with born digital content, but you know, for whatever reason, um, not we haven't had extensive um, digitized content come our way already. Um, the the Pizzamenti collection, which is currently online, was um, scanned a long time ago and 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 was in poor quality and. It took us probably five years of working with uh, that family to actually get the negatives. So that's a collection that's actually going to eventually be redone because the digital items that we received at that time and did have full permissions to use. Um, you know, in our very early days, we were, I think, just excited to have 
something that we could share with the public, that we have permission to share with the public. But we, um, it is in the works um, to actually go back and pretty much redo that collection because the family did finally um, give us everything um, or give us all of the negatives so that we could go back to the originals. Um, do we have I, and that that one that particular collection forms the backbone of our Spartanburg and World War II collection. They were pictures of Camp Croft, which was our World War II training camp. Yeah, I know. Like I know we had um, a, a local family who did um, land surveys, and mm -hmm. they had um, they want to they have talked with us in the past about providing us. Um, with their both their written documents and some of the digital files that they have and so you know we've we've whatever whatever and I, those you know a lot of collection a lot of conversations like this begin and then they stall out either on um, you know mostly because the family thinks about it and then they raise the issue and then you um, say yes we're open to talking with you about this and let's talk about our metadata structures and how we can make them work with the metadata structures that you will have in place so if you have you've already scanned a lot of your survey files in um, how can we take your spreadsheets and adapt them to the metadata templates that we have in place so that we could load them for use um, either by that family and also by the community so um, you know this is this isn't a great answer to your question really um, but it's largely because it just hasn't come up for us in a substantial way just yet um, but thankfully um, another thing to consider is security when it comes to born digital yeah. um, some people might be aware that we had a hack issue a couple of years ago at this library. So um, we, whenever we have something kind of come in in a CD or a flash drive, we have to get permission through our systems department to even put it into a staff computer uh, under threat that it could have a not knowing from the patron an issue in the um, drive itself. So that's another issue that we're exploring more and more is how do we even take the born digital items from our patrons and um, safely transfer them into our computers. Um, and we don't really even have a perfect answer at this time. It's kind of a case by case. Um, some staff computers are kind of like in between things. So we kind of test them out on those or we just make systems do a check through it. Again, thankfully, we've gotten maybe one or two flash drives in the whole archival collection. The vast majority of our patients are still giving us VHS tapes, um, for better or worse. That's kind of what the vast majority of what we have is. Um, so, um, you know, until we start getting hordes and hordes of CDs, I think we're just going to try and get a handle of what we have for VHS at this point. And, I mean, I'm sure it will happen eventually, but right now we're pretty steadily at the most of our audiovisual materials right now are... VHS tapes, so we don't have to worry too much about viruses in them. Um, what if what's been more some more interesting items you've come across so far in your work? What are some of the more interesting items we've come across in our work? Um, digital or just in general? In general. Um, how always one of my favorite is um we have a scrapbook um from when our first city female city council member, when she was a teenager, um, she was a very enthusiastic scrapbooker, um, but um, she put weird stuff in her scrapbook. I mean, I'm talking about like candy wrappers, um, a snake skin was in it, a cup <laughs> that her date had drinking out of. I mean, she was a <laughs> love 16 year old. Um, it was a very odd scrapbook and I, took a lot of stuff out of the scrap just because of how much organic material was in it. I mean, gum wrappers with gum in it. It was <laughs> very um, sentimental object with not too much pertaining to her actual accomplishments later in life. So um, I don't think she would get too mad that the scrapbook 
most parts of it did not get retained. But um, I always remember turning the page and there being a full snakeskin stuck to a scrapbook <laughs> page and thinking, oh, hello. Uh, one, of the, one of the collections that I really appreciate what is um, a collection of city ledgers that one of our um, Kennedy Room staff members was doing re research and went down to City Hall and um, basically discovered that there were these ledgers dating back to 1850, which documented they had been bound um, in about six volumes, and they basically documented our city council meetings from um, 1850 to, when is it Harrison? 1920? 1920. We're missing one. We're missing one volume. Um, and uh, we scanned all six of these and loaded them into um, Content DM. And over the last five years, uh, we've had a staff member transcribing these. Wow. Um, they were handwritten by the um, council clerk and they're fascinating because they are pre-Civil War era primary sources that document the growth of Spartanburg from a village. Um, it documents uh, the treatment of slaves in this community and um, takes you all the way through the development of the city with uh, electric light and sewage. And um, the council also acted as a de facto court system. So if businesses were being created and they needed permission um, to get their licenses approved, or if there were criminal disputes or other civil disputes, all of those people who were involved in those um, conversations, I guess you could say, um, are, are, are searchable now through the, um, through those transcripts, through that transcription work. And so they've become not just this great historical tool, but they're also a really rich source of genealogical material. And um, I'm, Harrison could, I mean, I'm sorry, Charity can expand on this, but you know, a good 85% of the work that our local history room does is, is genealogy. So what's, what's really important for me is is how these collections that we have can serve in both capacities, you know, as far as historical context and also these tiny little genealogical databases that um, are Googleable for patrons outside of our library system or who are completely unaware of what we have. You could search for somebody's name who's mentioned in the city ledger um, and go directly into our digital collections, and then you might discover our archival collection. So um, that collection for me, when that's finished, we're gonna have a really big party um, because it's <laughs> been, it's been um, something we've been working on for a really long time. Um, and I guess a question would be, what would be a dream collection for you? Oh, a dream collection. My dream collection right now, um, once this book eye scanner comes into the room, uh, is getting those yearbook collections from around the system digitized. Um, we have very little early African American pre integration schools records, and um, but we do have some people who are willing to allow us to scan some of those yearbooks, just not give them to us to put on the shelf in the Kennedy room. And so with the uh, book eye scanner, uh, we should be much more easily able and fast, more quickly able to digitize those yearbooks. And so um, we've got a couple of collections just waiting for that equipment to come in. Um, and so that that would be my dream collection. Um, I would also like to see us at some point get our uh, city directory collection digitized, um, but that's a little bit more complicated. Um, OCR, optical character recognition, um, is promised with this uh, book eye scanner. Um, we're going to test it out gently first to see if it how good it is and how much editing we have to do with that. 
Um, but then um, hopefully we can go into some more text heavy, more genealogical um, uh, resources that we have that um, people would be able to access without coming into the room necessarily. Although we love it when people come into the room. Um, in an average year since I've been here, we have had people come visit us from between 25 and 32 states wow. each of those years. And um, at least one or two foreign countries at le every year, as many as four foreign countries one of the years. Wow. And so um, some of those are doctoral students doing textile research in some of those um, archival collections that we have. No, most of them are genealogy researchers. Occasionally we get um, World War I researchers for Camp Wadsworth and World War II researchers for Camp Croft. And so our digital collections and our archival collections support a lot of different history and different research. We are also partnering with multiple of our local colleges and universities, of which we have a multitude, um, and working with not just their history departments and public history departments, but general um, humanities students for various projects. And so that has been exciting um, and something that has grown significantly over the five and a half years I've been here and looks like it's going to continue to grow. So that gives us a little bit more of the local history um, patron um, base in addition to the genealogy base. That's really exciting. Um, and I think maybe the last question, um, unless someone wants to chime in, would be how did you discover your passion for archival work? Ooh, how did we each? I'll go first, okay. and then I'll. <laughs> um, I came to archival work as a second career. Um, my first career was in church music. Um, I went to library school out in Kansas, where I had moved for a job, grew up in Virginia, um, and was volunteering in their genealogy uh, room, local history room in Kansas, went to library school at Emporia State. And um, when I went to library school, various friends of the family, including a number of librarians, all said, well, what took you so long? <laughs> because they knew every school project that I could cram into some sort of family history or local history um, purview. Um, OK, let me do a map recreating the Civil War battle that had eight people in it in the Shenandoah Valley um, for local history project and, and elementary school, whatever. Um, those types of things. And uh, I've always been a genealogist. And so I came to archives from the genealogy side. And um, since I manage our public service point, um, I think it's a, a nice little sweet spot for me. Um, I do have an archives concentration from Emporia State within my library degree, so I do know um, a lot about the, the setup of archives and those types of things, which did not hurt when I moved here, um, because not all that many library systems have a local history and genealogy space, and particularly the archival programs that we have at Spartanburg. And so I think that has been a, a really good fit for me. But yeah, I, I loved local history and genealogy since I was a kid, but um, I came in from the genealogy side. Um, yeah, mine's weird. Um, so an undergraduate, I was an ancient studies major. Um, which is basically an interdisciplinary classics major that doesn't want to learn Greek. Um, and so junior year, I went to my advisor's office and basically said, you know, like, I can't do four languages. We all know this. Um, I need, like, a career. Um, and you can't get hired with an ancient studies degree as much as I love you, advisor, who encouraged me to get this degree. Um, and she basically told me, like, you need to go into libraries. You're, you'd be great at it. And I was like, what? No. And she was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, okay, well, um, I need to get an internship then. And she was like, okay, well, let's just Google search library internships. And the only one that pops up is the Library of Congress Junior Fellowship. Um, so I 
did what they never tell you to do, and I only applied to one internship that summer, and it was the Library of Congress Junior <laughs> Fellowship, which I got. Um, and when I was there, um, I was basically cataloging ancient Mayan poison flasks, which is a very weird internship and not super related to libraries or archives at all. It was very much a weird museum internship. But um, while I was there, um, there was a talk by the manuscripts library in there, and she basically said um, something to the vein of, archives is just kind of archaeology with paper. You um, you open the box, you don't you have to dig through it, and you basically make sense of the puzzle that is within it, and at the end of the day, you have a very nicely organized box of manuscripts that you dug through, and you've organized and described, and you're basically doing archaeology with paper. And I was like, oh, I get it now. Um, and so um, when I graduated from my undergraduate with the very useful ancient studies degree, I um, then went straight on to graduate school at the University of Maryland, worked in their archive there. And um, when I finished there, um, they were hiring here in Sparnberg, back in my hometown. And um, I've been very happy ever since working in the local archive, which is very nice because I recognize names and photos and faces, which is very nice. That's um, so awesome. I've been. <laughs> yeah, she hit the ground running because she knew the place. That's great. That's my journey. Um, I came to archival work rather circuitously through um, some work that I was doing with um, the art history department at Wofford. I was digitizing their art history curriculum. And um, so I came to it through digitization. And that's when I first started to learn about different metadata schemas and how to present um, and, and make malleable um, collections of digital content. And um, so I actually started, I actually was working contractually with the Spartanburg County Public Library to um, digitize that postcard collection. And after I finished scanning it, I said to the director, hey, you gotta let me keep working on this because what are you gonna do with these 5,000 scans? And so <laughs> I, I, I worked on the metadata for that collection for probably 18 months, two years. And, um, and formatting a collection that large for Content DM took just as long um, because it's the double-sided images and um, when you're batch loading um, that many postcards into a collection, into a system, it there's just nothing but errors really when you're trying to <laughs> load it off. Um, so that took a while too. And then um, from there, I just slowly kind of inched my way into the library system and became <laughs> the digital projects librarian. And then when our digital collections department was extracted from the web services department, I became the head of digital collections. And then in 2016, um, our technical services department, our collection development department, our digital collections department merged into our collection management department. And so now I um, am still trying to uh, we're, we're still, we're, so we're still trying to keep the digital collection slowly. Obvious, you know, to be honest, the, the digital collections work has primarily been transcription mm -hmm. of, of one collection. And we have been uniquely focused on that while we get our archival collections under control. And mm -hmm. um, so um, we are days away from finishing that um, city ledger collection and then Harrison will have us ready to hit the ground running with new collections and with adding content that she's discovered in the archives to our existing digital collection. So here we go. <laughs> wow. That that's great. It's so great to hear from all of you and the work and the background. It's been really enlightening and inspirational. Um, congratulations. Thanks. Congratulations on your good work. It really shows. Um, well, we, we, we hid from you the, <laughs> all those angry meetings we had. <laughs> <laughs> it came to work <laughs> Well, and we appreciate the yeah. SCLA uh, Continuing Ed Committee asking us mm -hmm. to share about this because, yeah, we, we've come a long way, but we're, and we're ready to go into the next step of this process and journey.
that's great. So we'd love to hear again from you in the future. So please keep us posted and good luck to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And that Bye. concludes our webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. Okay.